Good morning. Welcome to the annual business meeting for 2021. It's taken a lot of people to put this meeting together and I think so far it's been a great success. I'd like to particularly thank all of our staff from Veritas for working so hard. For our industry sponsors, AMT, Atricure, Avanos, Geisinger, Medtronic, Casera, Pediatrics, Permanente Medicine, Specialty Surgical Products, Storts, and our institutional supporters, and for all of those who gave to the Abscess Sustainability Fund. Because of your kind donations, we've been able to make this meeting successful. We've got a full agenda today, including bylaws changes, which we'll get to in a moment. There'll be an open chat room and our Veritas staff will be monitoring that and then direct questions to the appropriate people. So please, if you have any questions, use that uh, facility and we'll get them answered for you. So with that, let me turn this over to our treasurer, Dr. Marjarka. Good morning. My name is Marjorie Arca and I'm the current treasurer of APSA giving the annual report for our association. Next slide. Next slide. The objectives for the talk is to give a broad overview of the financial status of the association for the calendar year 2020, the net operating revenues and expenses and the investment report. I will speak to the changes that the Board of Governors have implemented to manage financial loss and achieve fiduciary stabilization, including assumptions for a responsible management that our association will abide by moving forward. Lastly, I would like to report on our membership to reflect the perceived importance of belonging to our association. Next slide. 2020 represented a financial crossroads for APSA. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, we elected to host a free virtual annual meeting while other societies canceled theirs. The annual meeting typically provides APSA 40% of its annual revenue and this was not realized last year. However, the baseline expenditures for managing APSA remain the same. In addition, APSA was in the midst of a strategic change to partner with a different management company that has the capacity to be responsive to our growth and our sense of financial responsibility. As a result, we incurred a 352,000 net operating loss in 2020. Next slide, please. To help cover our operating expenses, we used money from our investments. There is a decrease in our net investment of over $500,000 from end of the year 2020 compared to the same time in 2019. Next slide, please. Therefore, between the operating expenses loss and a change in investment, APSA had a net asset loss of $570,000 last year. Next slide, please. In response to this, the Board of Governors promptly implemented changes to shore up our fiscal status. As all you may know, we asked the membership to uh, pay a voluntary sustainability fee. With the help of a consulting company, we reviewed several AMCs and selected Veritas as our new management company. Veritas seemed able to best accommodate our association's needs while allowing us to be fiscally responsible. This annual meeting is a testament to the wisdom of our choice. We also changed our investment firm, which I will detail in the next slide. The leadership performed a critical line-by-line -line assessment of our expenses and needs and came up with a one-third reduction of our expenses. This reduction was made possible by having a virtual annual meeting, such as what we're having now, in addition to other austerity measures. However, I believe that our annual expenses will be higher in 2022, assuming the normalization of activities, including a live or possibly a hybrid meeting. The decision for 2022's meeting will be made with all considerations in mind. To note, historically, our typical expenses for the association average about one to $1.2 million per year. Next slide, please. 
One of the important measures that the newly formed Finance Committee recommended is to consider changing our investment management company to maximize returns and to minimize fees. After interviewing several candidate companies, we switched from Wells Fargo to Mediquist, an investment company that specializes in not-for-profit groups such as APSA. Our annualized return with Wells Fargo was about 5.5% on the average with investment management fee of about 100 basis points. Mediquist designed a portfolio for us whose proposed asset allocation will yield about 8% return on average and have a lower management fee of about 65 basis points. With Mediquist, we will continue to avoid investments in alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and child labor. Next slide, please. Most importantly, the Finance Committee recommended and the APSA Board of Governors approved overall assumptions or rules of engagement for responsible, responsible fiduciary management. These include a neutral or net positive annual meeting and a neutral or net positive membership and administration budget. Furthermore, we would like to build reserves that would allow us to have two years of expenses on hand, which is best practice for associations such as ours. Next slide, please. Since we don't have a formal membership report, I would like to show you these data. 95% of our regular members and candidate members and 100% of our international members signed up again to be a member of APSA this year. With all the resources that APSA has for the practicing pediatric surgeon, NAT, expert, curated articles of interest, systematic reviews, tech talks, quality and safety toolkits, COVID panels, not to mention the unparalleled sense of camaraderie and single-minded focus of bringing the best care for children that our community has. I firmly believe that there is no other society that comes close to APSA's value to the practicing pediatric surgeon. Next slide, please. I would like to recognize and thank the inaugural members of the Finance Committee, Dr. Mike Chen, who was also APSA's former treasurer, Dr. Ken Gao, Dr. Kojin Sao, Dr. Bo Lovern, and Dr. Tom Whalen. Thanks also to Dr. Tom Tracy, our new executive director, and Sue O'Sullivan, Veritas president, who are both very instrumental in keeping our association in good financial standing in these challenging times. With the apparent running theme of hope for this meeting, I humbly leave APSA membership with this thought. We must accept finite disappointments, but we must never lose infinite hope. I now hand the meeting over to Dr. Max Langham, APSA secretary. Thank you. Marge, I'm gonna jump in there and uh, take care of the bylaws first, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Langham. Um, so all of you uh, received a month ago some of the proposed bylaws changes. This is something that we have to do uh, every year. Our bylaws committee and the Board of Governors have done undergone an extensive review uh, in the past year. Um, there are several things we need to go through. First, I'd like to get an approval for the minutes of the annual 2020 business meeting. And as I noted earlier, you'll be sent a link uh, at the end of today's meeting where you can vote electronically uh, for all of these items. So that first item is to improve the uh, minutes for the 2020 meeting. We've uh, changed the uh, committee status for the wellness committee uh, to a committee from just a, a task force. That will be one of the things you're asked to vote on. And then we've had some significant changes to the bylaws in, in this past year. And as I said, you've uh, been sent those all a month ahead of time. Let's take a minute and if, if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat and our Veritas staff can uh, direct them to me um, so that we can answer them for you. And thank you, Dr. Newman, for moving to approve, but we're going to uh, 
uh, do that by electronic vote at the end of the meeting rather than trying to do it um, here verbally through the chat or the like through the chat meeting. All right, seeing no changes, let me then uh, call on Dr. Max Langham for the uh, uh, secretary's report. Thank you, Dr. Waldhausen. Um, this um, falls to me to uh, announce losses to our membership over what has been a very trying year for all of us. Um, and I would like to inform the membership that we have lost the following um, members of our organization um, since our last meeting. Uh, Dr. Barry O'Donnell, Dr. Beverly Ellen Cheneau, Dr. Robert M. Filler, and Dr. Richard uh, Rick G. Ellis, both, both past presidents. Dr. Frank Gutman, Dr. Subramania J. Jethison, uh, and finally, Dr. Eric Bradley Jellin. Um, if any member knows of other uh, absent members um, in any category who have um, passed away in the past year, we would appreciate notification um, either through the text function or by email. Uh, thank you, Dr. Waldhausen. for a moment of silence for those who've passed away. So thank you. Let me now call on Dr. Mary Fallett to give the APSA Foundation report. Good morning, everyone. Next slide, please. So it's been about a year since I took over as the chair of the EPSA Foundation, um, and I'd like to give you our um, annual report. Next slide. Operationally, we've had a busy year. We had a two-part retreat to look at the bylaws and the membership of the board, uh, and basically to um, sort of revamp the way that we were thinking about donations and how we could give to APSA. We had monthly meetings. Um, we appointed task forces to approach gaps, challenges, um, the during and after transition of the management companies and for special considerations. We developed a funding request review process and expanded the ways to donate. Next slide. We also updated the mission and vision statements, um, remembering that the foundation is the companion to APSA, but it is not APSA. Um, we're joined at the hip, but we're different. And we're the philanthropic um, role for the um, organization. And with that in mind, we looked at the membership of the board and realized we needed to have some younger members. Um, and so we um, have now appointed two Grossfeld Scholar members from um, amongst the scholars who have received grants. Um, we also recognize that the secretary and treasurer have big jobs, but they should not be the same people from APSA, which has been historically the case. And so we now have a new secretary and treasurer, but we also recognize the importance of keeping our secretary and treasurer uh, from APSA on the board um, as voting members. We've made a number of bylaws changes and we've also recognized that the bylaws needed to be updated to be gender neutral. Next slide. Here's our small but mighty and very vocal board. Um, I'm proud to say that um, there's often vibrant discussions during the meetings um, perhaps a point of dubious distinction is we hardly ever end on time, um, but nevertheless, we've had animated and I think good discussions about how the board should be run. Next slide. So um, in keeping with 
the mission and vision of APSA. We've tried to align the mission and vision of the foundation. These are on the website, but basically they embody the principles that are also in our APSA mission and vision, but, re but recognize that we are the philanthropic partner of APSA um, and that we need to promote excellence in our discipline by fostering scientific, clinical, and educational endeavors through inspired giving. Next slide. The registered agent of the board used to be a member among us, and now it's an assignment and, and someone that's contracted through the board. But I just wanted to recognize that Dan Roby has been our agent since 2013. Um, and with that in mind, I have um, sent him a gift that hopefully he's received now, and I hope he's watching so that he understands how important his role was with us, and we thank you. Next slide. We solicited a membership opinion about donation strategy. It wasn't the greatest response. Nevertheless, there are some things that are legacy funding through the foundation. These include the Grossfeld Scholar Research Grants, which you can see categories there that we've realigned with that mission after discussing with Mrs. Grossfeld. We have the Grossfeld Lectureship um, that is now a research symposium. And we have the International Scholars and Global Initiatives that have been part of the organization for several years. The new buckets for donation include in innovation and informatics research and then education initiatives for the members and trainees that all have also been ongoing. And then we have a separate category for greatest need for those who um, do not have a preference. Next slide. The donation strategy is continuing through e-tapestry and electronic donations. We explored Venmo and PayPal, but unfortunately these are not available. The transparency of the donation should be a personal choice and this is being added to the donation form. And our ability to expand the buckets in the future is dependent not only on donations, but also on the market. Um, and also, I am trying to tighten up the gratitude and receipt process, including at year's end. Um, I've recognized through some personal emails that some of you have donated, and I have reached out to a few of you to make sure that you're getting a letter. Um, and if you don't, if you donate and you don't immediately get a letter or receipt, please let us know. Next slide. We're also improving the website. Um, this is part of the job of the secretary, um, Sean Kunisaki, but I have um, with him tried to update the history, um, recognizing that Dr. L. Wilkinson was really the inspiration for the foundation. Initially, I'm also trying to get some photographs of him to add to this. Next slide. And we have a Twitter account with a handle Inspired Giving. And one of the first things on it is the barnstorming initiative of our current secretary, Max Langham. And uh, please look at it and hopefully you'll feel inspired to donate. Next slide. The current state of finances are here. Um, we have had a good return on investment through the American College of Surgeons that's ranged from 4% to 20%, and we've ne nearly doubled what we've put in initially. Operationally, we have about 125,000 that includes recent donations. Our anticipated revenue is a little over 100,000, and our anticipated expenses are the same if we give three research grants, which is what we intend to do. Next slide. The um, donations in 2020 during the pandemic were about 5% of potential APSA members. Um, we have currently about a thousand or over a thousand members um, of um, great um, gratitude. Um, I will tell you that in between November 1st and March 31st, we've had $50,000 donated, um, which is great. I thank all of you who've participated in that. Um, I did send emails and letters to some of the groups such as the APSA and APSAF board members, the Grossfeld Scholars, 
the committee chairs and research committee members asking for, um, spe specifically asking for them to donate. Next slide. And uh, we also solicited um, opinions from our foundation award recipients who um, were asked to reflect on what the grant meant to them, but also we looked at return on investment and the return on investment for 10 of our grant recipients is over $65 million. Next slide. Um, next, go, go ahead. This is an animated slide. You can just keep going. So these are the three Grossfeld Scholars from 2020. Um, they will be giving reports in October during um, the, um, one of the APSA episodes um, and you'll get that date. Um, next slide. We have only this week um, met to determine the winners for next for this coming year, and those will be announced at the Grossfeld Research Symposium on June 5th. Um, the winners um, have not yet been notified. Expect that sometime next week. And lastly, um, just some style points. Um, so I think. For us on the board, our emphasis is on inspire, inspired giving. We want you to give because you want to support the future of our profession. Perhaps you or your junior partner or colleague or future fellow have been or will be the recipient in the future. And I wanted to emphasize that no gift is too small. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fallett. Are there any questions for Dr. Fallett? If there are, please just put them into the chat. We'll give people a minute to ask anything. Okay, seeing none, uh, it's now time to uh, transition uh, our leadership for the coming year. Uh, so uh, let's roll that and then we'll close the business meeting with some words from Dr. Barksdale and uh, then we'll move directly into the town hall. Being elected president of the American Pediatric Surgical Association has been the greatest honor of my academic career. Last year when Dr. Vacanti passed the gavel to me, I said I hoped to see everyone in person at our meeting this year. That obviously didn't work out as any of us had hoped, but with the great work of our committees, and especially Casey Calkins, Kathy Van Leeuwen and the program committee, Craig Lillehigh, Chuck Snyder and the PDC, David Powell, Tom Tracy and Veritas, I think we again overcame the issues at hand and I hope we're providing a meeting that you're finding enjoyable and educational. My sincere thanks to all of them and to our many committees who worked so hard to make this meeting a success. I would also like to thank all of those who gave so generously to APSA's Sustainability Fund and to the many institutions who donated further support. Your generosity helped us through a challenging financial year and I'm very grateful. It is now my honor to pass the gavel and presidential medal to Dr. Ed Barksdale, who will be APSA's 53rd president. At some point, I know Ed and I would both like to see the real Suave Cup medal and gavel, as COVID hasn't allowed this, but the honor for both of us is very real, all the same. Dr. Barksdale is exceptionally well qualified and equipped to be able to lead us in the coming year, and he's been my trusted partner, friend, and advisor for the last one. I am grateful, Ed, to you for all of your sage input on many of the issues we have dealt with in the past year. Ed, your name will be engraved on the presidential gavel along with all the others who preceded you as leaders of APSA. Take this gavel and medal as symbols of the honors our members have bestowed upon you as our new leader. We all stand behind you, eager to help you lead APSA into the future and help you write the next chapter in our success. Dr. Waldhausen, thank you so much. To the Board of Governors and to the membership, 
as well as to our management company, Veritas. This is a tremendous opportunity, not simply to lead a remarkable group of people, but to steward a tradition of excellence and service to children and their families. This has been, despite the pandemic, an incredibly remarkable year for our organization and an even more remarkable year for me. I've had the chance to work closely with a remarkable human being, individual and leader in Dr. Walthausen. I have watched him captain the ship of APSA during a tumultuous year. And his leadership reminds me of my grandmother's admonition that smooth seas don't make strong sailors. And he is a remarkably strong sailor, both at the helm of APSA and at the helm of his own boat uh, that he takes on the high seas. I eagerly look forward to the year that we will have together as an organization. I will make the same wish that Dr. Waldhausen made a year ago, that I hope to see you all at the next APSA meeting. But if I don't, then it's virtual. We will make APSA even stronger so that when we have that opportunity to again come together, that we can celebrate our history, our fellowship, as well as aggressively plan our future. Again, Dr. Waldhausen, John, Thank you for an incredible year. To the Board of Governors, thank you so much for your steadfast support uh, of our organization. And to the membership, uh, let's look forward to making APSA continue to be better year after year. Thank you again for this opportunity. Dr. Kandal, Jessica, this is a very special day for me. Um, not only is it the beginning of my presidency of APSA, it is my great opportunity to hand this cup, uh, the Suave cup, over to someone who I've known for more than three decades. I have admired uh, since we were residents at the MGH and some of my most favorite cases as a resident were done. I think that you will cherish this cup as much as I did over the last year. Uh, I wish that we could have all been together as a group of APSA, but I look forward to your leadership and your stewardship of our organization. And I pass this cup off to you. Ed, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity and the privilege of working with you yet again. Um, as you mentioned, we've known each other for more than 30 years, and I have had the particular privilege of following you around for a lot of that. <laughs> and I look forward to doing so for the next year. Um, with gratitude to our organization, the Board of Governors, and you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. So colleagues and, and members of, of APSA, uh, the passing of the gavel and the passing of the cup uh, were reported, but I just wanted to make a few uh, straightforward live and, and somewhat spontaneous comments to you as a, a membership and a group of colleagues. I am profoundly and uh, sincerely honored at this opportunity to steward the development and growth of such a great organization as the 53rd president. You know, I am humbled as I look back at the brilliant scientists, great clinicians, and even greater humanistic leaders who have served in this role previously. And I am deeply honored and inspired as we move boldly into the future. And clearly, the future looks extraordinary. I would sound like Pollyanna if I didn't acknowledge that the last year uh, for us 
as in the leadership has been one of great challenge. But we have weathered the storm of adversity, not only from the financial impact of the pandemic, but also from the changing of the management companies and our own kind of human anxieties about the future. But as Horace, the first century BC poet lyricist said, adversity has the effect of eliciting talents, which in prosperous circumstances would have lain dormant. And I have watched my colleagues on the board of governors, Dr. David Powell, Dr. Tom Tracy, the Veritas management company, the committee chairs, the kind of team of teams concept. I've watched people rise to the occasion to help make us all great. But I would be worse than insensitive if I didn't also acknowledge that this has been an even more devastating year for many of us in our families, in our workplace, and in our communities. And as we begin our emergence, and as we begin our recovery from the last 18 months, and as we celebrate our past and anticipate, anticipate our future, I think that we must most importantly honor our present. And by that, I mean that we must focus on our own wellness. We think a lot about our hospital, our communities and our patients, but as we move forward, I would like us to also think about ourselves and how we can be in the kind of old tradition of the South that we can be a tribe. That is that we can be for others and others can be for us as we move forward in wellness. So I would like to adopt during this year as my theme of, pre of our, my presidency, and I'll say it's our presidency, our organization, is that this will be a, a year of advocacy, activism, and leadership built on a foundation of surgeon wellness. Again, I thank you all. I look forward to the future, but let us embrace the present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Barksdale. Uh, we're a little early, but why don't we move right into the town hall? Um, let me acknowledge up front that uh, this may be a little awkward because we can't come up to the microphone, but we'll try as best we can through the chat because I think there's some important uh, topics that we need to discuss. I'd like to also remind everybody to try to visit the uh, sponsors today. Because of them, we've been able to put on this meeting. Um, and they're going to be important for our survival and uh, uh, putting on meetings well into the future. So again, let me thank all of you and welcome to attending this uh, town hall. There's some important topics that uh, the board needs your input on, and I appreciate all of you taking the time to attend. The past year and the fact that we've not had an in-person meeting for two years now has left many of us eager to get back together. See old friends, colleagues, and enjoy that personal touch that's been so important to our annual meeting. And while that impersonal experience ha has been vital to our organization, this past year and all the changes that the pandemic has thrust upon us has given us the opportunity to reevaluate who we are as an organization. As many of you know, when pediatric surgery first started out, the pediatric surgeon was not only the person who took care of the child in the operating room, but they wrote the TPN or the child's dietitian, the child's intensivist, and directed the overall care of a child. As time has gone on now, teams have become much more important and we've had to turn to others who may have more experience or more expertise than perhaps we do in order to provide comprehensive care for children. So that leads to the first question that I really wanted to get your input on today is how as we as fully trained pediatric surgeons care for the most complex children in our practices. And we can go to the next slide, please. And then next slide. As our numbers grow and the data shows that each of us as individuals and perhaps even some institutions are doing less numbers of complex cases, how do we maintain the fidelity and competence of our experience to provide high quality of care? Is this institutionally or individually derived? And what types of surgical care might fall into this fall into this category? Are we talking about cloacal extrophy, uh, stage four neuroblastoma with tumor wrapped around the celiac axis, and other major blood vessels? 
Next slide, please. Do we designate centers of excellence, such as has been done in bariatric surgery, where they do in Great Britain, where biliary triage is only sent to certain institutions within that country? And if we were to go that route, how would we designate such centers? And what would that mean for our specialty? And then what other means might there be to ensure the high quality of care and fidelity of these children with complex surgeries? So I know that there's some complex topics, a lot to unpack there, but let me open up to the chat and our Veritas staff will uh, try to direct it and we'll do our best to moderate this through the chat function and get people's opinions. So we'll give a few minutes for people to get started. As some of you can imagine, this stems from the Right Child, Right Surgeon Initiative, where you know we're really asking is how are we going to take care of children going on into the future, not just in the rural areas of America, but these specifically complex types of cases. When Dr. Fallett gave her presidential address uh, several years ago, she had come up with three different uh, types of pediatric surgeons, and this is potentially discussing a fourth type of pediatric surgeon uh, is those who are, are more experienced or institutions who are more experienced in really taking care of the most complex patients in our practices. John, one of the questions is a lot of this is based on, on not only preparation uh, of the individual surgeon uh, or the institution, but um, whether or not we need to take into account volume-based outcomes uh, and the realization that once we're in practice that there are changes in, in our capabilities to maintain uh, our own competence, but also uh, heading into our, our profession that there are certain institutions we would have trained at that would have volumes of cases that would prepare us better. Do you have any ideas about that? Well, I think that uh, if you look at uh, what Dr. Oldham did several years ago with the uh, ACS children's verification, it's pretty clear from literature that uh, the more cases that an institution does, probably the better the outcomes are. And that's certainly why in Great Britain, they designated centers of excellence for biliary atresia. But I think a lot of the, the literature that Dr. Oldham used to support the verification program suggests that as well. I think the question is, is how do we go about doing that? Uh, I know in, in some ways that's probably a third rail of pediatric surgery because when we train our fellows, everybody wants to be able to do those cases, but Ron Herschel and others have shown that many pediatric surgeons uh, are not doing a significant number of index cases. Uh, some of Ron's data is somewhat old now, maybe 10 years out of date, but even 10 years ago, I think the average pediatric surgeon was doing only one Wilms tumor a year. And if you're doing that sort of volume, the question is, is how good are you gonna be in the long run? And do we look at mechanisms with our own institutions where you designate somebody who's the expert and that person comes in and scrubs on every one? That's what we've done in Seattle is designated people who are uh, particularly good at a certain area and the group just calls on that person not necessarily to do the case but to be present and uh, available for when the case is done so that degree of expertise is is uh is there mary brand asked um, about uh you know a lot of the concerns that we have that are driven by economics and how do we manage a situation where the surgeon actually thinks that a patient should be referred to a, a higher level center, uh, but the administration within that institution prevents that from occurring, wanting to retain that case uh, for revenue purposes. Mary, I think that's uh, one of the difficult questions we're gonna have to answer. As Doug Barnhart said yesterday, there are no uh, authorities right now who designate where a lot of these cases have to be done or who's gonna do them. One could imagine that sometime in the future, we would have to get legislation or insurance companies uh, to help designate centers of excellence, which has already, I believe, started to happen in uh, some of our states like Texas. 
You know, uh, both, uh, there are two comments, one by Dr. Donahoe and one Dr. Puglandi about the ability to keep a network together by having the surgeon who referred the case come in and be able to uh, participate in the care of the patient. Um, have you had any experience with that? And that uh, can that be uh, an advantage to helping us uh, uh, parse out these cases? We have, and I think that's an excellent way to do it. We used to partner with the two pediatric surgeons in Kalispell, Montana, and you know they didn't have a particularly high volume, but when they had a complex case like that, they would come over to Seattle. We um, had them on the medical staff, got them hospital privileges, and they would scrub with us. Um, and then when the patient ended up going back to Montana, the family had a surgeon that they knew, the surgeon had been involved in their care and was able to maintain the continuity. I don't know if Doug Barnhart's out there, um, if uh, that's something similar to what they're currently doing in, in the uh, Eastern half of Montana. Um, one of the um, concerns that got brought up, and I think it was brought up yesterday, uh, uh, Doug Barnhart alluded to this, uh, John, in, in the really the great presidential symposium that they put on, is that although we've been able to maintain um, the, uh, the levels of index cases within training programs from the board's data, uh, and it may not, and, and for the first time they're using volume based determinants in the training programs. There are different flavors and, and experiences in the, in the training programs. Would pulling cases away uh, uh, affect our training programs? And, and do we think that that's a, <clears throat> a potential complication as well? That's a loaded question. Um, one could see how that would potentially happen. I think most of the training programs though are in areas where uh, they've got a reasonable volume of cases if they didn't the RRC wouldn't have certified them or given them ongoing uh, certification to have a program. Um, but I think that things change over time. And just because we have a training program now doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna have a training program forever. And that's why I think it's incumbent upon the RRC to continually evaluate programs and assess their ability to uh, provide our trainees with the appropriate caseload and experience that's that's required. Um, there are various ways that training programs can alter their caseload, I think, if they run into trouble, um, varying the number of fellows that they have. Um, one of the potential uh, ways that the right child, right surgeon can fit in with this is I realize that realistically, there is uh, somewhat of a service component uh, to the number of fellows we have in a program. Um, they, you need a certain number of people to take care of all the patients, operate on them, take care of them in the ICU, et cetera. Uh, the broad vision for Right Child, Right Surgeon is if programs want to get involved with that, you could have another, per, another trainee who is training to do uh, some of these pediatric surgical cases that they can then go out into the rural parts of America with you know, the military and whatnot, and still maintain the workforce within the program that's needed to take care of the children that are there. Because I realize not all programs are necessarily resourced with uh, PAs and ARNPs who can pick up some of that load. So uh, this is a question for Ed Barksdale, um, and it comes uh, from Adam Vogel, who would like you to expand a little bit on, on what we're talking about now with your concept of a team of teams. And how do we begin maybe to consider the, what John has referred to as the third rail, but the regionalization that might be better uh, accomplished through uh, either health policy or, or economic policy um, and is there a way that APSA could begin to outline some of that uh, so that we can get the teams uh, that are aligned with, the, with either the community centers or the community teams uh, and the teams in the tertiary or complex uh, centers uh, uh, of care? Dr. Vogel, thank you for asking that question. Uh, it was not planned. <laughs> so a, a part of what I hope we can begin uh, during this next year is to think about how we as members of, of APSA can position ourselves to have a louder 
or more recognizable voice with the change makers within our countries and within our communities by one, getting a better un understanding of the issues and connecting with those political and local leaders who can affect the change. I think that we sometimes anticipate that our hospital administration, our community leaders and our society understands what the issues are uh, as well as we do. But I think we have to, in order to advocate, we have to communicate and educate and, uh, and also come together as a team so that we can Im influence them. So I would invite you, Dr. Vogel, uh, after this meeting, I'll reach out to you because it's gonna take many minds within our organization to figure out our strategic way of approaching uh, our leaders. And, and again, Ed, I'd like to uh, stay with you, but um, uh, Mike Klein uh, is uh, bringing up some, some ideas about the innovative ways and maybe lessons learned from this year about extending through technology into the community so that we could provide support to uh, other areas or in fact, uh, be able to direct some care uh, from the complex center to, to fully competent community centers, but uh, uh, just need some direction. Yeah, so uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Klein, and also thank you, Dr. Tracy. Uh, back to my previous comments that I think this is not as easy as it seems, and, and maybe I'm working within my own geopolitical environment when much of the decisions about transferring a patient or not transferring a patient are, are at times outside of, of my ability as surgeon in chief to make the decision. So there are finance people who are looking at that. So I think that as we as an organization developing uh, guidelines that we endorse and support and leveraging our strength as an organization will allow us to have greater impact on our local healthcare systems than individual practitioners attempting to um, bear that weight or burden to make these things happen. So again, it comes to us building a sense of, of community and then leveraging that strength uh, nationally and regionally. One of the threads, and, and this is either for, for John or Ed or, or, or uh, Jessica, if you're still on, uh, you could say that the responsibility of the training program, direct, uh, training program directors for maintaining uh, volumes and understanding uh, whether their volumes are falling off and 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 then also is there a role for uh, mentorship after training such that uh, we can join with either other specialists or uh, maybe even adult when you consider a patobiliary or other considerations that would bring our centers and the, and the, the, the uh, level of care up so two two areas to focus on uh, that is um, uh, our training programs and their responsibility, and then secondarily, the kind of uh, mentorship and support that's needed uh, in the transition to practice. Yeah, I can, I can start with that, Tom. I, I think, you know, having been a previous training program director, uh, I think the director has uh, two large responsibilities. One is to make sure the trainee is exposed uh, and has the appropriate uh, ability to get educated in the broad range of pediatric surgery so that when they leave the program, they are competent to be able to go out and practice and safely take care of children. But I think it's also incumbent upon the program directors and even more so now is to ensure that our trainees um, have adequate access to employment and employment that's gonna be fulfilling and something that they're going to enjoy. And as we saw in the presidential symposium yesterday, I think that there's no question that that's uh, becoming an increasing issue uh, across the training programs in the United States. So I think that's something that the Association for Pediatric Surgery Training Program Directors is gonna to have to pay attention to because I think they have a moral obligation to look out for the trainees and what they're gonna do once they're done. I think one of the roles that APSA can fulfill is uh, mentoring for people once they get out into practice. And this may be one of the options for uh, how we get rural America 
and those 10 million children who aren't currently covered taken care of. Um, there may be, as Mary Fallett has worked on, ways for uh, many APSA members to mentor via, via telehealth or some other means. Uh, the, the, the surgeons out in rural Wyoming or Montana or Eastern Washington who need help taking care of a child. Um, I don't think we figured that out yet, but I think that's gonna be an important role for APSA in the future. So this is part of a transition question that, uh, that I think comes to you and Ed, and, and I'd like uh, to put you on the spot, John. I know that your passion for the right child, right surgeon <clears throat> is also you know, up to the practical task of getting this done. And so part of this working out what the complexity and the centers of excellence, et cetera, is gonna depend on a lot of work and our committees have done well. Do you have any plans uh, for the future to not only define this complexity, but understand whether APSA has a role in, in recognizing it either in the individual or in the center? Um, and how do you think that we should approach that over the next year? Uh, our immediate plans, uh, since we've just developed a curriculum and kudos to our education committee, Steve Lee and all of his members for developing that along with uh, entrustable professional activities. It's really a masterpiece of an educational platform. They work with the ACS Rural Surgery Advisory Council as well as the military and Rob Ricca. What I'm hoping to do is create pilot programs with the military uh, because there's, those are people who are gonna go out and be doing humanitarian care. And I think by taking baby steps, we can move forward in that, in that, in that, in that manner. We've also developed a task force uh, composed of the education workforce uh, practice committees to try to put together uh, means for um, how we might uh, look at not necessarily certifying, but uh, recognizing those who've completed uh, this curriculum that the Education Committee has come up with. We also are planning to put that curriculum in front of the uh, program directors for uh, adult general surgery. Uh, as you know, Tom, you and I had uh, talked to them earlier in this year, and now that we have a curriculum, I think that uh, we can now go back to them with some uh, solid recommendations and look for means of rural surgery programs incorporating more pediatric surgery into their training paradigm. Um, may I just uh, um, propose something that we haven't uh, taken a look at, but the uh, urology uh, community, the pediatric urology community, um, started to put together, probably within the last five to 10 years, um, a, a multi-institutional um, consortium for bladder extrophy. And uh, uh, in this consortium, um, there are uh, people from uh, uh, Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, um, the um, CHOP, and also uh, Boston Children's. And what they do is they travel, um, um, you know, they have children that they line up for one or two days. They travel from one institution to another, and then they, they record the uh, cases because, as you know, some of these are not, you know, not all bladder extrophies rated equal. And then they learn uh, from each other. And, um, and then also <clears throat> the uh, institution um, from which the child um, is, you know, being cared for uh, takes care of the child and does not have that family move from one place to the other. It, um, it's, a, it's a really uh, interesting uh, practice. And uh, again, it, it is one of those things that recognizes expertise in um, uh, a, um, a disease process or a congenital anomaly that not everyone sees. But what they do is they also uh, have a research component for it so that the outcomes of the children are, um, are uh, tracked and everyone can learn from it. It, it uh, is a, it's a different paradigm of how to take care of for these complex patients. I see some of the stuff on the, um, on the chat about how about, you know, redo esophageal surgery or redo anorectal malformation, but um, that would be uh, kind of something uh, to, to think about for some of the, you know, you know, I see no one is really an expert in, in doing a cloacal extrophy after, you know, finishing a fellowship, but just something to think about in a select group of patients that obviously do not need an, an urgent or emergency surgery, um, something that uh, we can um, 
we can think about uh, in the future of how to. In some ways, we've uh, some of our subspecialists in pediatric surgery have already developed that, and those who are focusing on uh, colorectal work. I will. I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember what the PCPLC all stands for, but they have uh, frequent conferences where they get nationally, they get together nationally over Zoom meetings or electronically go over difficult cases and have a whole research network. So uh, that sort of thing already exists within our own specialty. And one could see that potentially um, occurring for other areas, particularly in complex surgery. Well, I know the board has another, another major question that they want to ask. So I'm going to ask Ted to bring up the slides. And then Dave Powell, if you would monitor the, the chat for, um, for questions that come in. Uh, on, on this question. So the second question that I wanted to bring up to the membership, um, historically, uh, APSA has been, a has been an organization that represents just pediatric surgeons. But as I said in my opening statement, we are now uh, really involved in teams when we care for the child if we want to provide comprehensive care. Few of us are anymore the intensivist, the person writing TPN, all that sort of thing. So should the APSA of the future be a bigger organization where we potentially allow or create categories of membership or even sections like the AAP has done to allow non-MDs to participate in our organization? Do we do that right up front? Do we take more baby steps and figure out a way to allow uh, non-MDs who work with us to have access to our educational materials? But I think this is a big question that's gonna help guide the board uh, as we move into the next few years. So let me open that up for discussion. So I think some of the issues are how do we maintain the professional aspects that we all like in AMSA so much, you know, the personal, the social interactions and relationships. One of our pillars is now diversity. So how do we become a more diverse and inclusive organization? Next slide. Um, and as I said, how, what, if we were to include others, what does that look like? Would they be allowed to serve on committees? Would they vote? Um, so let's uh, see what people have to say. John, there's a lot of good questions coming up in the chat and it occurs to me last discussion plus this discussion, some of us are kind of stuck in the old paradigm of what it means to be an APSA member or what it means to be a trainee or what it means to be a center of excellence. APSA has a really good track record of doing things and thinking out of the box. And I think that's an approach that we might use. The questions here are, uh, what, how would this affect the viability of APSNA? There are some, some physician extender groups that have their own association, but there are clearly some that do not. And is it up to APSA to offer a home for those people? Well, I think the, the question about APSNA is, is an excellent one. Uh, we've actually had discussions with them this year, and I think APSNA uh, does want to remain separate, but groups like the physician's assistants don't have any place where they can be a member. If the right child, right surgeon comes to fruition and we start having uh, adult general surgeons out in rural America, uh, that are trained to take care of children, where are they going to get their educational opportunities? Um, opportunities for them are limited at places like the American College of Surgeons or, or, or other meetings. And APSA, I would envision as being the home for those people to get their educational needs. There are a couple of professional associations, the vascular surgeons, the burn surgeons, I think the bariatric surgery people who have already taken this step to include non-surgeons in their organization. And I think I'm seeing some rolling in the chat that I, I don't know any experience like that that has not been overwhelmingly positive. Yeah, I think, you know, as I said, we all work in teams now. 
and our own hospital. And as much as I love going to APSA and getting together with friends who I haven't seen for a year, at least from my perspective, and I would love to hear Ed's because I think Ed may feel a little differently. Uh, from my perspective, I don't think that we're going to lose that even if we do open our umbrella. Um, I think it is going to enrich our experience. I think there's plenty of things I can learn uh, from other people who might be joining our meeting. Um, so for me, being more inclusive enhances our educational opportunities that we receive and also that we can give. So if, if that's an invitation for an opinion, uh, it is. I, <laughs> I, I'd like to say that uh, in general, my personality is that of inclusion and building community. And as I mentioned in our discussion the other day that, um, and I overuse quotes, aphorisms and metaphors, but good fences make good neighbors. And I would agree with having affiliate members, but I want to ensure in these times when there are many issues facing us as pediatric surgeons, that, um, that we also are aware of whatever our identity is as an organization. And I think if the membership wishes to expand our identity to that of a group that cares for children surgically, that is responsible for the care of surgeons as a leader, I would, I, I would move in that direction. But that is, is not, I must say, my vision. And my vision doesn't matter. It's the vision of the, of the corpus that matters. But I think that we, we have a lot to learn from the APPs and for others. But I think it's important for us, especially in these times, to be much more cohesive as pediatric surgeons. I think it's going to be very difficult for us to, to move toward right child, right surgeon, while we're having other voices coming in. That's just my bias. And uh, I accept that that may be uh, maybe ultra conservative. Uh, it's not meant to be chauvinistic. Well, it's been an interesting discussion that I've had, Ed and I have had many times over the past year. <laughs> I'm not sure that there's a right answer. I think one way, you know, with many things is maybe to approach this with uh, baby steps. And when we discussed this on the Board of Governors uh, the other day, I think the board's feeling is that it would be reasonable to try to find ways to provide apps as educational materials for anybody involved in the surgical care of, of children. Because I think that's one of apps's real missions is how do we take care of the surgical, surgical child? How do we educate those who are helping us do that as well as educating ourselves? So jo uh, Dr. Waldhausen, I I'd like to add to that um, then, uh, when, I, when we think of the surgical care of children, would we invite families as well to be uh, members of APSA? Because they are a critical, as we think of whole, whole, holism and holistic care, they are, are critical as well. And, and I see people saying that we need to have the voice of the providers. Um, would you envision that would be a part of our evolution as well? I think that would be an excellent idea, Ed. You know, many bo most boards now uh, do have some sort of family representative or, or non-physician representative. I know in the American Board of Surgery, they've got somebody who's uh, a non-physician member to bring that outside opinion. And in Children's Hospital, I'm sure yours, everybody else's, family members are involved in a lot of the board decisions. So yes, I think that that would be a critical component going forward. And, and so uh, again, I, we're talking about affiliate membership, which I endorse, or full membership. Um, you, you I think would, that's, that's, uh, that's up for discussion, Ed. I don't, I don't know that we're ready to make that decision yet. What I'm hoping to do today is open the conversation to our members, get their input, um, because I don't think this is something that the board can just 
take off and do on its own. I think we need the input from all of our members because this is our organization. Uh, the board can't work in isolation. We've got to know what everybody else thinks and use everybody's input before we can make a decision. There seems to be in the chat a lot of general support for an affiliate membership or including APPs or parents and families and our things. I wonder if someone could comment on, we really see APSA as a source or a place where we can display our identity of P as pediatric surgeons. And I hear that as a criticism that to allow non-surgeons into APSA really diminishes our but we, our identity of what we think of as ourselves. And I'd like to see some comments whether they think, I, I happen to think that opening up ABSA to a more diverse population that had different professional choices than I did probably improves my identity as the person who is responsible for taking care of the kid. Maybe less so as the pediatric surgeon, but more as the leader of a team. Well, let me pose to uh, Dr. Powell that what would people think of having a section like the AAP has various sections. APSA had a section for families, a section for PAs, a section for uh, adult general surgeons um, outside of the main membership, but ex have access to all of our educational tools. Dr. Berkstead, what's your thought on that? I, I apologize. I was reading the comments in the chat and not. Oh, really I just wanted your take on the idea of sections for families, a section for PAs, a section for um, adult general surgeons who are outside of APSA's main membership, don't yeah. necessarily initially have the right to vote, but have accessibility to all of our educational materials. I, I hope that you would know from our private discussions, I am gun ho for that. Um, I, um, again, uh, I, I think Dr. Geiger uh, may have said it uh, well in, in the chat, which I was reading, is that, you know, we uh, increasing the breadth of the tent uh, gets more ideas. Uh, however, uh, increasing, you know, making people members as pediatric surgeons, I, I'm still in, the, in that arena that um, let's develop affiliate memberships let's see how that works out over years and then as we evolve as the country evolves then maybe we decide that we can eliminate those fences um but i don't want any walls i, I want to hear the voice of people who will help us be better for our patients our communities and for ourselves Dr. Powell, anything else that we should be addressing? No, I think I, I am kind of like Ed, I am totally mesmerized by reading the chat, <laughs> as, is, as is always the case. Uh, pediatric surgeons are really good at not just voicing their opinion, but voicing their good ideas. And uh, man, I hope somebody is recording this because I can't keep up with the notes. I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, really exciting you know, APSA over the past several years has really moved away from what it was originally intended to be. But in doing that, I think it has really moved closer to what its original mission would be. And it's just exciting to see all the people participating in this meeting. I see um, a um, uh, comment or several comments in the chat regarding bringing this to a vote, uh, perhaps uh, to the membership. Uh, with regards to uh, the, um, you know, whether or not we uh, have affiliate members or associate members or um, something like that. Um, so I don't know if that's something that we'll do. Um, I, I did um, note that, you know, there is an affiliate uh, membership for IPEG non-voting, and I believe it's the same for the American College of Surgeons uh, for um, mid-level providers. You know, one of the wonderful things that we have uh, in APSA and, and it's been pretty evident this year with the restructuring of the committee work is how, you know, hard they work and how much they've gotten accomplished. And 
we challenged Kevin Mullen, who's chair of the membership committee, to, re to look at our, our actual membership uh, this year, and especially with uh, respect to the financial considerations we had and expansion. So you'll see some bylaws changes that you'll be voting on. But I think between um, the, the committees of, of membership, uh, practice, workforce, uh, and others that others might think about, that we could probably come up with uh, some structural uh, a straw plan to put in front of the membership um, under Ed's and the board's leadership uh, uh, fairly soon. I think, you know, the, the richness of this discussion in, in the chat um, may move us to be able to think of this uh, uh, early in the year. I think there's a great comment from Scott that sums up kind of how I think about this. Uh, from an APSA point of view, an APSA or pediatric surgeon centric point of view, it seems like a good idea to get other opinions and other input from other places. But the fact of the matter is, if we're gonna do this, I think we should, if we're gonna do this, we need to be adding value or providing a, a function or a feature so that these folks are interested in joining. There's a reason why we only have like a half a dozen affiliate members now who are general surgeons or not. There's a reason why, there's a reason why the, uh, AP, the PAs aren't interested in joining APSA. APSNA, rather. We need to be able to have set up as part of this proposal, what's the value to them of coming to join APSA? Fully agree, fully agree. One of the suggestions in the chat, uh, David, comes from Mike Chen, who said we ought to have a, a vote on the concept of expanding membership and then work out details. Uh, and that makes sense to me. I thought, Max, maybe we ought to vote on the concept of expanding inclusion and then figure out the membership. Because I think that actually the benefits or whatever, it, whatever membership means, uh, I think that's where some of us draw the line. I, I, like, the, I like your repackaging. I think that uh, voting on the inclusion is great. Maybe that's something we could do uh, early in the year under Dr. Barksdale's presidency and then go from there. Yeah, I don't think Tom Tracy has enough to do right now. <laughs> well, I, I think by looking at, at what's in the chat, uh, this seems to be a very important issue that we should begin to address early on. I think Tom, if we're going to Monday, Tom, I'll call you Monday. And we'll get moving. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to make a suggestion. I, well, I had well, an empty uh, calendar, yeah. and I now I now know that we can keep it moving. Yeah, I'm going to suggest while Tom is working on that, all of those people who are in the chat who thought this was either a good or a bad idea. I'd encourage you to reach out to your your advanced practice specialists, to your PAs, and figure out what it is that they want. What it is, you know, we we we've interviewed and surveyed a handful of PAs and a handful, and we all have anecdotal experience in our practice, but I think it'd be super important to reach out to a broader cohort of people who think we wanna get involved and see what they want and make sure that we provide the right thing for them. Just an interesting anecdote for, for um, and, and Marge alluded to this in terms of you know, our membership and, and the, the retention and how valued we are. Um, I had an interesting call the other day from the Society of Vascular Surgery that uh, realized that they had a huge gap in their knowledge about um, pediatric surgical vascular conditions um, and uh, collaboration with pediatric surgeons who are asking for help. Um, and I, I think that um, in terms of fear of losing um, our presence with, with this inclusion, uh, it, was, it was very obvious to the leaders in vascular surgery that APSA is the leadership uh, and that that's who they turn to, to to try to find out uh, how to fill their knowledge gaps and how to, how to engage pediatric surgeons. Uh, and it, it was just interesting with society to society. Uh, this happens a lot, but the fact that they came to us, I think it's great. Well, it seems like we've got a lot of input from the members. 
a uh, lot for uh, the board to think about in the coming uh, coming weeks to months. Maybe we should take a break and then uh, we'll move into the uh, main meeting. Right. So I want to thank all of you for attending both the business meeting and the town hall today. Uh, the board really appreciates your input. Again, this is your organization. The board can't work in isolation. We need to know what you think. So please don't con hesitate to contact any member of the board uh, or committee chair. Let us know what your thoughts are because um, we really want to hear from you. So why don't we take a break? We will reconvene at what I think is 11.45 Eastern, 10.45 Central, 9.45 Mountain, and 8.45 Pacific. So thanks all very much. <laughs>